Ellora, fate, religion, and art. Faith, it is a strong belief in a supernatural power or powers that control human destiny. And religion is an institution to express this belief in the divine power. Religion is a system of belief and art had become a driving force of religion. Elora is an example of this art, an art that one needs a special vision to see and experience. At Elora, we are not merely examining the arts, but instead seeking to understand the overall process where the human activity of seeing becomes a meaningful and religious experience. So, we not only look at the role of art in relation to religious traditions, but also look at the way this vision changes from culture to culture, from Hinduism, to Buddhism, to Jainism. In Ellora, the visual arts are not objects of sight, distanced from the viewer. Instead, the viewer becomes a participant and intimately bound to the object looked at. However, the power of this art is not in the greatness of the art itself, but in its historic association. This magic art moves us from within. Here, we have art of such aesthetic power and genius that it grasps us, the beholder, and takes us beyond history to a time when faith virtually moved mountains. Elora tells us that art in praise of God can stand on its own and can be beautiful even to the eyes of the unbeliever. Elora displays the perspective of the artist and the age he lived in. Once created, Elora has stood as a creation that is not only vibrant but has given birth to new possibilities that go beyond the intentions of the original builders. Verul, now known as Ellora, is located nearly 30 kilometers away from the city of Aurangabad in Maharashtra. The caves were excavated and carved out of the vertical basalt face of the Charanandri Hills. Near the cave number 32, we can still see the channels through which the volcanic lava once flowed. These basalt rocks are ideal material for the kind of architecture and craftsmanship that the Ellora represents, enabling the craftsmen to express their vision and art on rock as a permanent memorial. This area is also noted for its antiquity, and archaeologists have found evidence to show that it was inhabited 20,000 years ago. In the early centuries of the Christian era, the Satavahana dynasty ruled the area. During this time, Ellora became an important center. Besides support from traders and merchants, religious centers like Ellora also received royal patronage. Though most of the inscriptions commemorating this have faded with time, an inscription on the back wall of the front mandap of cave number 15 remembers the patronage of Rashtrakuta Danti Durga, who ruled from 753 to 757 AD. Again, in cave number 16, there is an inscription that attributes the famous Kailash temple to Krishna I, who was Danti Durga's uncle and successor. Ellora goes beyond a chronological categorization. It can also be classified in terms of religion. Unlike Ajinta, Ellora does not confine itself to Buddhist caves alone. It has Hindu and Jain temples as well. The Buddhist caves and a majority of the Hindu caves are from the Rashtrakuta times. The Jain caves came later during the period of the Western Chalukyas 
and the Yadavas of Deogiri. Thus we find here the greatest single confluence of religions, indicating religious tolerance and the solidarity of different faiths during these times. Having remained open to the world throughout its existence, the Elora Caves attracted a regular stream of pilgrims, foreign visitors, travellers and royal personages. There are innumerable recorded accounts that speak of these visits. The Elora Caves were first excavated during the Kalichari era in the 6th century AD, beginning with cave number 29, the Dumarlene Cave. This was followed by cave number 10 or the Vishwakarma Cave and the Dotal and Tintal Caves which are numbered 11 and 12. These were created during the Chalukya period that lasted from the 7th century to the early 8th century. And finally came cave number 15 or the Inscription Cave during the Rashtrakuta period that lasted through the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries. The Hindu or Brahmanical temples dominate Ellora. They are 17 in number, while there are 12 Buddhist and 5 Jain shrines each, thus making up a total of 34 temples. The Buddhist temples came first, in the beginning of the 5th century AD, followed by the Hindu temples. Located near the Girija river, Ellora soon became a Hindu pilgrimage center. After that came the four Jain shrines. As in the earlier Buddhist temples, the Ellora Caves too were obviously worked upon by craftsmen who attempted to recreate the visual and textural effects of woodwork. Though the paintings at Ellora have faded away and are lost to posterity, about five of its caves have nurtured its wall paintings. The relationship between art, religion and commerce comes alive in the caves at Ellora. As the maritime trade between Rome and Southeast Asia peaked, it was reflected on rock with magnificent arches and pillars and the detailed facades of temples. The Buddhist monks often traveled along the trade routes in the company of traders who commissioned work on the temples. As time passed, the architecture of these caves grew progressively more sophisticated. The high point of the sophistication can be found in the monolithic Hindu temple of Kailash at Ellora. Buddhist Caves Let's begin with cave number one. This is a vihara or residential quarters with four cells cut into the side walls for monks to stay around a square assembly hall. This cave is devoid of any carvings, pillars or sculptures. Adjoining it is cave number two, which is a worship hall and is accessed by a flight of stairs. In a recess in its outer veranda, we find images of Panchika, the god of wealth, and Hariti, the goddess of prosperity. At the entrance stand Dwarapalas or guards, flanked by windows. The hall is supported by 12 pillars, some of which are decorated with motifs of pots and foliage. A gallery runs down each side. In the center of the back wall is a seated Buddha three meters high and two standing Buddhas. Along each of these side walls are five Buddhas accompanied by Bodhisattvas and Apsaras, the celestial nymphs. Cave three is similar with a square central chamber. The Buddha sits on a lotus at the far end Around the walls are 12 meditation cells. The two-storied cave number four is now virtually in ruins. There is a Buddha sitting under the people tree and another in a shrine. The second one is unfinished. Motives of pots and foliage adorn the columns of the hall. Cave number five is different. Excavated at a higher level, it is the largest of the single-storied caves and contains a spacious hall divided into three aisles. Porches in the middle of the side walls hold small cells on either side. 
intricately wrought foliage surround columns that are decorated with medallions and other motives. Benches have been carved out of the floor. This probably means that the cave was used as a dining hall. The entrance to the central shrine is carved with bodhisattvas in intricate headgear and jewelry. There is a seated Buddha, but he sits on a chair or stool rather than cross-legged on the floor as usual. Cave number six contains many elaborately done sculptures. The facade contains an unusual scene of the goddess Tara rescuing devotees from a snake, a sword, an elephant, fire and a shipwreck. Number seven is a simple hall with four plain figures. Cave number eight, however, stands out because it is the only shrine in Ellora where the sanctum is away from the rear wall with a circular passage running around it. This passage also contains cells. Cave nine has an open terrace with a balcony and a shrine. Cave ten is a Chaitya or prayer hall and is named after Vishwakarma, the architect of the gods. This cave is said to mark the culmination of Chaitya architecture in India. The prayer hall is situated below the monks' residential quarters. The hall has porticos on three sides, raised on a basement, carved with animals. A stupa here has a large seated Buddha figure, accompanied by flying attendants and bodhisattvas. A flight of steps in the veranda leads to the upper gallery. Here we find Chaitya window motifs, flying celestials and bodhisattvas with female attendants. The decorated facade of this cave is so finely finished that it gives the impression of woodwork. And then come the 8th century caves numbered 11 and 12. The former is three-storied and has a basement. It contains lodgings for monks and hostels for travelers on the upper level and a shrine below. Images of Durga and Ganesh suggest that the cave was later used by Hindus. Cave number 12 is the last of the Buddhist caves and contains cells for sleeping. However, the interesting feature here is the series of seven Buddhas pointing to the belief that the Buddha reincarnates on earth once in 5,000 years and has already been born seven times. Hindu Caves Caves 13 to 29 are Hindu temples. Constructed between 600 and 875 AD, they are replete with images of gods and goddesses, apsaras and tree nymphs, motifs of animals, plants and trees. Their workmanship is so detailed and complex that it must have taken centuries for their planning and execution. The high point of the Hindu temples is undoubtedly cave number 16, the Kailash temple. It is dedicated to Lord Shiva but pays homage to other gods as well. There are columned galleries, three stories high, large sculpted panels and alcoves containing enormous sculptures. An inscription on this temple acknowledges the patronage of the Rashtrakuta ruler Krishna I who ruled from 757 to 783 AD. Mount Kailash is the mythical abode of Lord Shiva, the third face of the Hindu trinity, which consists of Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. In attempting to recreate this version of paradise, the ancient craftsmen and artists of Elora came up with something of an architectural marvel. Cave number 16 of Elora, the Kailash temple, is the largest monolithic structure in the world. Carved out of a single rock, it equals the area of the Greek Parthenon and is almost double its height. This 8th century creation took 7,000 craftsmen a hundred years to build, cutting painstakingly through 85,000 cubic meters of the volcanic rock. Two great trenches, measuring about 90 meters in length, were first cut into the hillside using hammers and chisels. They were connected at their deepest point by another trench measuring 53 meters across. 
Having prepared the field, the workman then set out to carve the 30 meter high residual stone, giving it shape and significance. It was conceived and executed by architects from the Pallava kingdom of the south. While normal temple structures are built from the base upwards, the Kailash temple was worked upon from top downwards, cutting and carving on rock with cautious precision to fashion the slow grandeur of their artistic expression, giving the impression of a freestanding, multi-story temple complex, the phenomenon of Elora actually rests on a single mammoth rock. The temple complex has four main parts. The first is the gateway to the temple, which is two stories high and opens into an imposing U-shaped courtyard with enormous carved pillars on either side. This courtyard is surrounded by columned galleries three stories high. In an earlier time, stone bridges used to connect these galleries to the structures of the central temple but they have now fallen. The second part of the complex is the temple itself, built in the manner of an ornate pyramid, carved elaborately with Indian cultural and religious symbols. The third part is a Nandi shrine in the middle, which is one of the most important sculptures here. And finally, we have cloisters for the inhabitants surrounding the courtyard. The plinth of the building looks like a floor by itself, and adds to its amazing stature. Above and below this plinth, the substructure has been worked upon and contoured, while a frieze of elephants and lions occupies the space in the center. The base of the main temple is so ingeniously fashioned that it gives the impression that elephants are holding up the entire structure. The deities to the left of the entrance are mostly Shaivite, while the ones to the right are Vaishnavite. The entrance itself is 50 meters long and 33 meters wide. Its tower rises 29 meters above the level of the courtyard. Goddesses Ganga and Yamuna form the door jams and welcome us through this sacred threshold with a symbolic purification by the waters of the holy rivers. We then come upon two seated sages, Vyasa and Valmiki, the legendary authors of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. We are now greeted by symbols of prosperity and well-being. Four columns in the porch with their motives of vases and foliage carry a message of fruition and prosperity. Kubera, the god of wealth, adorns both sides of the doorway along with the conch and the lotus. Shiva's wife and son complete our reception committee. Durga, the slayer of evil, and Ganesha, the deity of good fortune. The temple is flanked on either side by two pillars 16 meters high. They are believed to have once borne the trident of Shiva. In the cubicle opposite, we meet Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Elephants line the courtyard on either side. Turning the corner, we come across a panel on the left. This shows Kama, the god of desire, holding aloft his bow and five arrows, one for each of our senses. To the left of the entrance on the far wall behind the pillars is a shrine dedicated to the three river goddesses, Ganga, flanked by Yamuna and Saraswati. They represent the three streams of purity, devotion and wisdom. There is a series of panels here portraying Shiva and Vishnu myths, a graphic gallery for worshippers down the ages. The south wall has stories from the Ramayana and a series of images, Ravana offering his heads, Shiva and Parvati with Nandi the bull and the lingam, Shiva playing the veena, Shiva and Parvati playing dice, the marriage of Shiva and Parvati, the origin of the lingam which is the symbol of Shiva representing creative energy, Shiva dancing, Ravana shakes Mount Kailash on a panel of the South Mandapam as he attempts to carry it away, disturbing Parvati and her attendants. One of the women is seen frightened and fleeing, but Shiva restores order with a movement of his toe. Along the north wall are stories from the Mahabharata on top 
and the legends of Krishna below. They include Krishna stealing buttermilk, Vishnu as Narasimha, half man, half lion, Vishnu reclining on Ananta, the serpent, and Vishnu the preserver. Finally, we see Annapurna, the goddess of plenty. In the inner porch, we come across two panels showing Shiva as the lord of knowledge and also as Bhairava, killing the elephant demon. The steps of the main shrine lead to the upper floor which contains a mandapam with 16 substantial pillars arranged in groups of four. And then finally, at the far end, is the core of this magnificent temple. It's Garbhagraha or Sanctum with Ganga and Yamuna guarding the door. The sanctum contains the sacred Yoni Lingam symbolizing the vast creative energy of Lord Shiva. Running around the back of the sanctum is a passageway with five small shrines, each with a replica of the main temple. The Kailash temple represents many significant dimensions. It is the single largest work of art executed in India. It is a classic and unrivaled example of rock-cut architecture and intricate sculpture. It represents the vision, ingenuity and labour of innumerable people down the ages. It represents a liberating visit to the icy reaches of Mount Kailash itself, the abode of Lord Shiva. Standing within these walls, it is difficult to ignore the tremendous spiritual energy that characterised its creation and preserved it through the warp and weft of unfolding centuries, making it one of the oldest wonders of our modern world. Jain Caves The five Jain Caves were built between 800 and 1000 AD. They are massive and well proportioned and they mark the final phase of activity in Elora. The series of Jain Caves at Elora are amongst the best examples of Jain monuments in Maharashtra. These caves contain intricately carved decorative pillar motifs that speak volumes of the richness and skill of the cave architects. Cave number 30, dating back to the early part of the 9th century, was referred to as the Chota Kailash. It was intended to be a small-scale replica of the Kailash temple, but it was never completed. The columned shrine has 22 Tirthankaras with Mahavir in the sanctum. Built around the same time, cave number 32 was known as Indrasabha. It is considered the finest of the Jain temples here and is dedicated to Mahavir. A simple gateway leads into an open courtyard. In the middle of this stands the shrine. Carved elephants, lions and Tirthankaras fill the walls. The lower wall is incomplete. But the upper one contains carvings of Ambika and Mahavir flanked by Tirthankaras. The ceiling is richly carved with a massive lotus at the centre while painted figures pass among the clouds. On the whole, these temples depict facets of Jain philosophy and teachings and also reflect the severe asceticism of the faith. Though not as large as the other caves, the Jain caves are repositories of very detailed works of art and many of them had beautifully painted ceilings and intricately carved pillars, some of which are still visible. Thus, besides being a coming together of three great religions in a single landmark location, Elora is also a memorial to the stunning creative beauty that was possible so many centuries ago.